We are here in Vancouver um, during uh, the 2017 uh, Parkinson Disease and Women Disorders uh, Congress. And uh, my name is Joe Jankovic. Um, I'm a professor of neurology at uh, Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas. And it's my pleasure and honor today to talk with uh, Dr. Mark Stacy from um, Duke University. I'll let him introduce himself in a moment. Uh, by full disclosure, uh, Dr. Stacy is uh, one of my most accomplished uh, fellows, and I'm one of his biggest fans. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, uh, uh, let me uh, just uh, say that uh, Dr. Stacy and I share uh, many, many values, uh, including um, uh, our uh, love and dedication to our families. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I can ask you to introduce yourself and then start talking about your family. Well, thanks, Joe. Um, this is uh, quite an honor for me, and uh, we'll struggle through it somehow. Um, but uh, you were one that reminded me of how important family was as I started my career and uh, uh, watching you model how you worked with your sons and kept them in uh, your uh, life despite how busy you were. It was an important thing for me to, to see early, early on. And as you remember, Andrea, my daughter, was born at the end of my fellowship um, and one of the happiest mem memories I have is um, we were on rounds one day, and it was the day after Andrew was born, maybe two days, and I really wanted to go just see my daughter, and you knew it, I, I, but you didn't ever let on, and you said, oh, we don't really have any patients today, why don't we go see the new baby? <laughs> uh, and I remember how fun that was uh, that you shared that moment with us. Um, uh, as you know, Brian and Andrew are very important to me. Brian is an artist who uh, is um, in Wilmington, North Carolina, and making a go of it uh, as a, uh, a tattoo artist and a muralist. Um, but as a small business owner, he's done very well. Uh, Andrea is 25 and trying to get a neuroscience, not trying, getting a neuroscience uh, a PhD at Brandeis University. Well, you have, you have obviously done uh, something right uh, with you and Tina raising uh, your uh, two yeah. children. And uh, what about Tina? Uh, what uh, role has Tina played in your life? Um, so, uh, the first week I met Tina was the first time I had applied to med medical school and I had just been rejected. Uh, and my family really didn't know what to make of that and Tina was the person to say, look, you want to do this, you need to go for it. Um, and so, even we, after we had been just dating a short time, her uh, positive influence on me uh, to, uh, to keep doing what I wanted to do uh, was uh, the thing that mattered. Um, we married just before I started medical school, after uh, I applied again, um, and uh, without her uh, friendship, uh, her enthusiasm, and sometimes um, guidance, uh, I would not have really been able to navigate this career. Uh, as you know, I've had several moves, and uh, she's been instrumental in helping me kind of determine whether that was right for us or not. She has a career of her own. She's uh, uh, PhD in engineering and was on faculty at Villanova when I was a resident and faculty at University of Missouri right after the fellowship uh, and then went into industry in Phoenix uh, before going back to be a lab director at the University of North Carolina. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, your beginnings um, before we talk about your professional accomplishments. Uh, maybe you can tell us what got, what got you interested in medicine and then eventually in neurology. I've always thought about why I went into medicine, and I can't really point to a specific moment. Um, I had, my mother was one of eight children, and six were girls, and two were boys, and one of the men was a surgeon in Vietnam, um, and was revered by all of my aunts. Uh, and my aunts were very important to me, and I thought, okay, I can be revered this way, is all I could think. Um, but it really wasn't until I got rejected from medical school that I decided that was my goal. And once it was taken from me, I started putting more time into it. <laughs> so what have you learned from that uh, initial disappointment of being rejected? Um, it, it was a long lesson, but that lesson uh, was really, you have to make a determination of what you want, uh, and you have to commit to it. Uh, and you have to accept that there's a risk, uh, and the risk will be horribly disappointing, but if you don't take the risk, the chance that you don't get in is, or you don't get what you want is much less. And so I, I didn't really take that risk the first time I applied, and, and once my wife 
then girlfriend said, you need to go for this. Um, it became important to me, um, and I think that's what made the difference. So which awful medical school rejected you? University of Missouri. Oh all of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, so where did you go undergrad? At Southeast Missouri State University. Okay. So, so you were a Missouri boy. Yeah. And, uh, so my uh, dad was the first person to go to college in his family, and he went there on a scholarship. And I think he, he was very young, and I think he thought, well, you know, it was good for me, and he went on to be a university president, so it obviously was. Um, so I was given the option of going to the University of Missouri for undergrad, where he would not be able to afford medical school, versus going to Southeast Missouri State, where he could. Mm -hmm. And then he got away with it. I got married, and I paid for medical school, or Tina did. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a partnership. Yeah, maybe it's, so. It's a partnership. <laughs> so you come from an academic background, yes. right? Uh, so uh, what role has your father played in your decision to pursue academic uh, career? So uh, one of the great things about having a father who, or a, a parent who has gone through um, academic challenges is learning about tactics. Um, when I did my fellowship with you, I learned how to build an organization and I modeled that. Um, I learned to get a strategic plan and to get goals and to move for that. I learned to be organizational. But tactics is not something you really learn un until you experience them. And so my dad and I enjoyed a great relationship when I would call him and say, well, there's somebody trying to get me to do this and I don't understand why. And he would just say, bang, bang, bang. Mm -hmm. And I would be able to go back and um, outwit or, or, get, or move my career forward and, and move the uh, goals forward. And so that uh, mentoring um, was fun for us both, particularly because he was so good at it uh, and it almost always worked, uh, that um, we have had a, an, a very enjoyable relationship in, in a father-son uh, way of how he passed some of these skills to me that had come natural to him. What about your mom? Tell us a little bit about your mom. <coughs> My mom is uh, the soul of the family. Uh, she uh, uh, is a, a daughter of a minister, um, she's, um, and she got his social ministry from him. Not so much uh, the church, uh, but she's now 78, and um, she has gone to this little, she's still in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, at uh, Southeast Missouri State, and she has decided to adopt the students who are coming from other countries. So she went to the Baptist Student Union and said, we're going to have a dinner every Sunday night and a lunch every Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are probably 150 kids in this little town of Cape Girardeau who uh, count on her. Uh, they go to her house. Uh, they keep her happy. Um, and they call her Grandma Jane. Mm -hmm. And the reason they do, they finally told her, is uh, they're uh, people of color for the most part. And when they go out into this little southern town, the shopkeepers would follow them around. <coughs> and so they would say, you know Grandma Jane? And they'd say, who? Because everybody knows my mother. <coughs> and they'd say, Jane Stacy. So and after we tell them that, they leave us alone. <laughs> so so she, that's what she does. She has quite a reputation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, you went to medical school, uh, University of Missouri? Yes. Uh, they finally did accept They you. did, they finally uh, did. On a second trial? <laughs> right. <laughs> And then um, after medical school, where did you do your internship and residency? So I interned at St. Mary's Hospital. Tina was still finishing her PhD, and um, there was a rule at University of Missouri that you didn't get a one-year internship unless you were going to do your residency there. So I went to the closest place I could. Uh -huh. uh, Brian was born during that intern year. Uh, not a good idea to have a, a, a baby during an intern <laughs> year. <laughs> um, and then I went to Hahnemann University um, in Philadelphia, uh, and I think uh, there's a useful lesson there. It worked out great for me, but I counted on a faculty member at the University of Missouri to give me advice. And he was friends with the chair uh, at Hahnemann. Mm -hmm. um, and so he told me that Hahnemann University was the best place to go in the country. Um, and uh, it was maybe the best place for me to go, but, but I believed it. And so I went and um, it turned out fine for me. Um, but I think it would have been better for me to get a, a wide range of advice. <laughs> so during your neurology residency, uh, did you get exposed to movement disorders? Uh, what actually triggered 
your interest in movement disorders? So about four months in, um, we were we had a, a hospital in the community uh, in Chester, Pennsylvania. It was called Crozier Hospital, and we spent two months twice, there were three per year, um, and there was a man that was brought in by his family who uh, now clearly had Parkinson's disease, but I didn't really know, uh, but they couldn't take care of him anymore, um, and they hadn't seen anybody, and so they just wheeled him in, and he had a uh, psychic pillow, uh, he, he didn't have horrible tremor, but he was just profoundly bradykinesic, kinetic, um, and so Norm Leopold, who you may remember, um, since he wrote a letter for me to get my <laughs> fellowship, um, uh, was my attending, and I said, I think this man has Parkinson's. Can we give him a feeding tube and try this levodopa? Um, mm -hmm. And he said yes, and we kind of talked it through, and you know, uh, now three decades later, I, I know that the potential for three feedings of levodopa through a feeding tube should not have mm -hmm. done as well for him, but he had never seen it, and he was just awakened. Um, and I thought, oh, this is really something I'd like to do. Um, Dr. Leopold helped me uh, work that out, and he, in fact, gave me great advice and said, you're a clinician, the person you want to work with, uh, I think, would be Joe Jankovic, and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, w it was a definitely a pleasure for me to interview. I still remember our, our, our interview, how personable you were, mm -hmm. and I knew that uh, there was a potential for an outstanding clinician, and even so I... Uh, it's one of the best decisions I made professionally, um, uh, uh, including you in our fellowship program. Uh, so uh, just give me your impression about your fellowship. What, uh, what, what did you learn in terms of uh, you know, movement disorders? Uh, was there anything else that you learned uh, besides movement disorders during your fellowship? Uh, just give me your impression about the movement disorder fellowship. Um, so I'll speak for all fellows to say we're scared to death on the first day, uh, <laughs> and we learn not to be scared uh, fairly quickly. Um, uh, I learned to, to be very efficient. Um, I learned to really like the phenomenology and uh, to make it uh, and, and, and to make it a priority and take pride in it. Uh, and I I do think um, we have a risk of during the molecular age of uh, medicine that we don't take pride in the phenomenology uh, and we need to continue to, to, to press on students and fellows and residents and ourselves that phenomenology is what we do. Um, one of the first uh, real lessons I had from you uh, was we were seeing a patient and it was maybe the first month uh, and I presented this so everybody, nobody, nobody, not everybody knows that you present in front of, that a fellow presents in front of you, so you can see the patient and, and kind of watch through, um, which teaches you to present really uh, correctly and fairly. Um, and I went through this, and it was a patient with, a, with an atypical Parkinson's, um, and you said, what refinery do you work at? And everybody was surprised but you, and he told you the refinery he worked at, and you said, uh, well, this is kind of a, a Parkinson's um, flavor that we see in that uh, refinery, and it, um, uh, it helped me to remember that y you have to always think about the environment and when you're looking at uh, uh, patients with these unusual movement disorders. I mean, you have an amazing memory. I uh, obviously don't remember that incident, but uh, you obviously have an amazing recollection. There, mm -hmm. there are really kind of three. The, uh, uh, I, I talked about one, uh, but maybe the most important one was about halfway through um, when I again was kind of being at a B-plus level, I think, uh, and, and you pulled me aside and said, you know, you could really contribute to movement disorders, uh, but you need to be more compulsive. And you gave me that B-compulsive button. <laughs> um, but it was important to me, and uh, I did become more compulsive uh, and have kept that in mind throughout my career. You mentioned something that uh, I wanted to uh, spend a minute or two on, on and that is that... Um, one of my um, uh, sort of fetishes is to have the patient presented um, in front of the patient. Now, that is not shared by the, all attendings. Uh, many attendings uh, prefer discussing the patient uh, in f uh, outside the, the examining room and then coming in and say, well, I just discussed uh, your situation, your history with my fellow resident, and this is what we're going to do. And I always thought that this was 
not uh, the most appropriate way of uh, interacting, you know, with patients. So, as you know, I feel very strongly about uh, having the fellows uh, presenting uh, in front of the patient uh, uh, for several reasons. One, uh, so that the patient listens to the story and they are engaged uh, in, in, the, in the history. Um, and uh, also it validates for me that the history that the fellow presents uh, is correct. And, and also I think uh, it uh, is, uh, has a positive outcome because invariably when a fellow f completes the presentation, uh, the patient said, wow, this was my life story. What a great way of, uh, you know, summarizing my, my life story. And so those are some of the reasons why I prefer, you know, having the, the patient uh, presented um, uh, in front of the patient. The patient needs to be engaged. Uh, um, so that lesson that you learn <laughs> during the, your fellowship, are you applying it now? I or uh, and, and so does Bert Scott, who was uh, also a fellow with you and now is a colleague mm -hmm. at Duke with me. Um, what about your colleagues uh, at, at Duke? Uh, so, um, Dr. No, they, they didn't train with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, the, the fellows that uh, train with Bert and I, uh, I think they do do that when they're, when they're in an academic center. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of them have gone to academic yeah. centers. But I think it also uh, it teaches a fellow to be uh, accurate and precise. It also m models how you, you have to make a decision. Uh, and you can't go out and, you know, figure out what you're going to say and then make a decision. Um, you, it, w when I was there, you had a fairly long walk to your office. So I had that, you know, three minutes to kind of put my thoughts together and mm -hmm. come get you. Uh, I don't know how fellows have, how long a walk they have now, but you do need a little bit of time before they drag you back into the office. Um, but and I, I often tell the fellows yeah. before they present uh, that they should collect their thoughts. Yeah. You may recall uh, me. Uh, you didn't have to tell me that. <laughs> 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 you, so. you did have to tell me, you know, you might want Tina to review your manuscript before you turn <laughs> it into me for grammar. <laughs> so uh, speaking of manuscripts and projects, um, uh, so uh, looking back, uh, which project uh, during your fellowship you think had the greatest impact on your professional career? Um, the Tardive Stereotopy Manuscript. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a manuscript that uh, stereotopies are, are uh, I, I still am surprised it's a controversial term. It should not be. Um, but uh, I remember you gave me option to come up with a project and you kept asking and it got to about October and, I, and you finally said, can I help you with a project? And <laughs> I said, thank you. Uh, and so um, we wanted to look at a hundred patients that were seen consecutively with these uh, movement disorders, and um, I cataloged them, um, and, and it took a long time. I had to learn how to use databases. I had never actually used uh, a, a computer to put a database together. I uh, made a mistake and got off one line and had to start over, so that taught me to be even more compulsive about making sure I got this uh, correct. Um, and it allowed me to, to, to take a new concept uh, and try to synthesize it within the literature. Um, and I thought that was a good lesson. We submitted the, f the first manuscript uh, to movement disorders with video, um, and it was rejected. There were a number of very good comments, um, but it made me mad. Uh, and you suggested that we revise and resubmit to movement disorders, and I didn't want to. I wanted to submit to neurology. And, and you let me do that. Um, uh, and, and what I liked about it in, uh, years later is um, I didn't do what you said, and you still supported me fully. And I think that's the job of a mentor, is you give advice, but if they don't take your advice, it's a gift. Uh, and, and so you can say, all right, they didn't like my gift, but it doesn't mean I have to stop giving them. It doesn't mean, because if, if you get angry with somebody who doesn't take your advice, then it isn't a gift. Uh, it's an expectation. Uh, and I've always used that in, in trying to with my kids, with, with uh, everyone, trying to say, all right, I'll be generous with you and I'll still support you if you don't really think my advice works. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when uh, Chico, uh, Dr. Cardoso came in and kind of looked at all those videos, videos to help us finish off that manuscript, um, it, it was a, a really nice um, experience in, uh, w with a junior colleague. 
uh, we enjoyed working together. He was very grateful to, you know, to not have to go through all those charts, I maybe, but uh, he was very grateful to, to be a part of that project. And we've remained very good friends since that time. Well, Dr. Cardoso is uh, also one of my accomplished uh, fellows. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of him. Um, so uh, obviously the Tardive uh, stereotypy paper uh, was, was important and, uh, and it's frequently quoted yes. uh, and uh, um, I, I has an impact uh, on um, drug-induced movement disorders. Uh, speaking of uh, drug-induced, uh, not necessarily movement disorders, but maybe behavioral disorders, um, that is another uh, major accomplishment uh, of yours. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the background of uh, your discovery about the uh, impulse control disorder? Well, as I um, kind of watched the evolution of the field, uh, I think uh, your generation kind of defined all the motor features of Parkinson's disease. And, my, and mine uh, generation kind of said, well, what's left? And so we started looking at non-motor. And, uh, and I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at non-motor symptoms. But um, just like you modeled, your clinic helps inform your research, which makes you a better doctor. Um, I always have modeled that. Um, and I remember on a Tuesday, a patient came in with his wife and said, doctor, since he was last here, he's lost $60,000 in a Native American gaming casino. Um, and I looked to see what I had done, and I had raised the dose of a dopamine agonist from right in the mid-range to a step up, but not to the top of the range. Um, and it was just like bang. And then on Thursday, a patient came in, and his wife said almost exactly the th same thing. And I uh, raised his, um, another dopamine agonist, uh, a step. I found out later he was taking more than that, which is a common thing we now know with ICD. Mm -hmm. uh, but I went back and looked at um, these two patients uh, and, and tried to think, all right, what happened? They had both recently moved from a, a northern city. Uh, they had moved to this retirement area. They had fairly severe Parkinson's disease, and there were social events, and one of those was taking a bus to a Native American casino. And so you, they've just, they no longer work, they've disrupted their previous lives, and there's a chance to be social, and they don't have to be mobile. Um, and I think those were all factors that they'd never gambled before, but I didn't think they had the real opportunity before. So I sat on that for a little while, and then we tried to find others by our database work, another thing you taught me to do. Um, and we identified seven others. And so we reported those nine um, patients uh, in the Barcelona meeting in 2000, I think. Uh, Andrew Lees reported funding at the same time. And there was another case report of, uh, I think, um, binge eating, maybe. Um, and so. We were all, I don't know if you remember the room, it was a really small poster room, and so we were all kind of around together, and we thinking, huh, that's interesting. Uh, and some senior people said, you know, you need to be careful with this. Maybe they all were just at this opportunity, and it puts a drug at risk. So I'm very proud that it, now we know that 14% of the, the Parkinson's population has one of these problems. Um, but I'm most proud that I was able to kind of navigate to, to kind of get to a reasoned and fair understanding of this without putting a drug class at risk because we would really be hampered if we didn't have those drugs available. Um, but that has been a quite a career trajectory. Um, many people have helped in trying to help define that syndrome and we did two NIH um, meetings uh, to help us with that. But you know, it's an example of how power of observation can lead you to um, synthesizing um, information and then making uh, additional discoveries yeah. and then uh, this obviously has um, impact on uh, uh, the way we practice medicine yeah. and uh, your uh, first paper clearly has changed uh, uh, the way we view dopamine agonists and yeah. other dopaminergic drugs. Yeah. What I really like about it is it's a brief report um, and it essentially listed all the things we've been studying since you know 1993 or 2003, 2003. Um, and so uh, when I now review papers, I really try to condense them to make them as brief as possible because we don't have time to read these long manuscripts of, uh, you know, the pathologist of the 1920s. Um, and so the, the, the more precise and concise you can be, the better. So after your fellowship at uh, Baylor, where did you go after that? 
And we went back to the University of Missouri. Tina had taken a year off, um, and she wanted to, to kind of get reboot her career. Uh, so she joined the faculty of the engineering department, and I joined the neurology department. Um, that's one I wish I had back. Um, I, I know that I could have stayed, um, and uh, uh, but you know it, my career has uh, done okay. Uh, one of the things that happened to me the Friday I got to, I was going to start on a Monday, and the Friday I got there, they told me that the chair who had hired me was resigning that day. Mm. Um, and I think that is a horrible thing to do to a young faculty member. But they didn't want me to not come, and so uh, they didn't tell me the truth, and so. Um, I was left without uh, the chair who promised me a package, and I had to navigate that, which is when I first started talking to my dad about what do I do now. So how long did you stay there? Five years. Mm -hmm. And then where did you go from there? Uh, then I went to the Barrow Neurological Institute, um, okay. a job that... In Phoenix. Yeah, okay. uh, a job that you helped me with. As you, as you remember, I was unhappy at University of Missouri for a number of reasons, and I looked at another job, and... You said, oh, that sounds like a good opportunity. And the next day, Dr. Lieberman called me and said, why don't you come look here? Um, and there was only one person who could have done that. I didn't know Dr. Lieberman at all at the time. And so um, it was a good fit for us. Uh, and there we had an opportunity to, uh, uh, through a, a fundraiser in the town, to meet the Ali's. And uh, uh, Dr. Lieberman, I, I suggested that Dr. Lieberman asked the Ali's to come dedicate the new NPF Center because he had changed from APDA to NPF. And um, he won up that and said, can we put your name on the center? And it's turned out to be a very nice thing. So maybe you can tell me what you remember about meeting uh, Muhammad ha Ali and uh, what kind of interactions you had with him. So the, um, the first time people meet Muhammad Ali, I, I didn't cry, but I've seen many, many people cry just meeting him. I've never known anybody that had that effect on people. Um, and uh, he was um, uh, fairly mobile at that time. H his voice wasn't very good, and he was not, he didn't like to talk in, in public. So we worked to see what he could do when we dedicated the center. And so we um, um, commissioned a torch to be made. He had just written the Olympic torch, and so he unveiled that. Um, and, and so I didn't really get a chance to talk with him until after that. And we talked a little bit. Um, and it was Mrs. Ali and, and Muhammad. Um, and Muhammad was being distracted by all kinds of things and entertaining. Uh, and I asked them what it, they wanted the, me to do with the center. Um, and Mrs. Ali, that's when Mrs. Ali said, I want you to find a cure for Parkinson's, which I, I wouldn't have been able to do there. And certainly everybody else is looking at that. But Muhammad will want you to take care of everybody regardless of ability to pay. And he turned around and said, and that was it. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> as we got to know each other, and I think as I fulfilled that promise uh, that I really wanted to honor their requests, uh, we became very good friends. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Ali would bring her son, uh, and, and I don't want to speak for, her, for their son uh, or Mrs. Ali, but if your dad is Muhammad Ali, I bet that would get really old. <laughs> uh, and so they would come and want to spend a week in Phoenix and go see baseball games. And if Muhammad was there, you know, they don't get to see the baseball game. And, and, he's, and, and it, their son is now a baseball coach. Mm -hmm. And so one day a week, uh, one day during that week, it would just be me and Muhammad. And we would just do whatever he wanted to do. Um, and I thought it was really funny. Um, he would make me drive in the left-hand lane. And so when we pulled up to stoplights, he could reach down and knock on, he was huge. He could knock on the window, uh, <laughs> and people would just be dumbfounded that he would do that. And I, I thought it was hilarious, and mm -hmm. we could do that for hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to Mrs. Ali um, several months ago and told her how funny I thought that was, and she said, yeah, it may have been funny one day a year, Mark, <laughs> but you try the other 364. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had the pleasure and honor of meeting both of them, and mm -hmm. it uh, was uh, really uh, a special uh, occasion for me. Um, so, uh, how, how much time did you spend at Barrow? How many years? Seven years. Seven years. Mm -hmm. And then, where did you go from there? So then I went to Duke from there. Uh, mm -hmm. And I re actually remember asking Mrs. Ali if that was okay. And she mm -hmm. said, it, it was. It's time for you to go. And remember that first mission I told you about. Mm -hmm. um, so, it was a very good move for us. Um, 
So uh, at Duke, you establish the movement is sort of uh, centered uh, there, uh, but then gradually you were rising in uh, your a on an academic ladder. You eventually became a full professor, and uh, now you are an administrator. <laughs> so t tell us about the transition from uh, a clinician to a bureaucrat. <laughs> well, uh, so when I first got to Duke, I wanted to start a clinical trial program, and I had run a very big clinical trial program at Phoenix, um, and uh, there were, uh, I think, bureaucratic uh, unwritten rules that um, made the, uh, the neurology clinical research group dis unfunctional. Uh, it wasn't dysfunctional. It just didn't work at all, and I knew that uh, building the center would be absolutely critical for that to work. And so um, after about a year, I was asked to assume the responsibility for that. And we uh, had a lot of coordinators, one coordinator per one per physician. Uh, and so there were more people than uh, participants <laughs> uh, or employees than participants when I took that over and began really putting a structure where we reduced uh, that dependence on each other, that those marriages between a PI and, and a coordinator, and uh, reconfigured our staff to have some people interested in regulatory work, some people interested in coordination. Um, and uh, the secret weapon to all that was Lisa Gager. And so Lisa Gager, you, you remember, trained, um, uh, that, well, I guess trained with you, but went to see what you were doing when Dr. Warren Olenow started his center in Tampa. And he had hired Lisa, and he said, well, go see what Dr. Jankovic does with Botox and <laughs> uh, these sort of things. And uh, so Lisa worked with Warren Olenow for eight years, and then Dr. Bob Hauser for another eight, uh, mm -hmm. maybe longer than that, and uh, wanted to come back to North Carolina as I was going back. And so the two of us, through our friendship in the Parkinson Study Group, because um, I knew her husband and we played golf together and things, um, really were a pretty good force. And so we drove... The, this neurology clinical research organization um, to success, there was a, a, uh, an issue at Duke about concerns about billing that turned out to be nothing, but we were really concerned about it at the moment. Uh, and when the leadership looked for successful research, clinical research groups, neurology was the only one. And so they asked me to be an associate dean and make 16 others of them from a discipline. Um, and then the um, Vice Dean for Research didn't want to do clinical research anymore, and so they created the Vice Dean for Clinical Research um, position, uh, and it fit me pretty well. So this is the position you hold now, yes. and uh, so uh, do you feel satisfied, fulfilled uh, professionally in that uh, position? Do you miss uh, the clinical uh, aspect of uh, movement disorders research? So I still see patients two days a week, uh, two half days. Um, during the Movement Disorder Society meeting, um, I wish I spent more time in movement disorders. Um, but, you know, there are constraints in every career, and there are, every career should be individualized to maximize its uh, success, and uh, I enjoy a lot of the aspects of administrative work. Um, I like the fact that uh, there's a neurologist, or a neurosurgeon at Duke who worked with a team to look at poliovirus and putting that in patients with glioblastoma, and there's a sense that this may be something that prolongs the life of those patients. I'm glad to be the person behind the scenes that made sure we had GCP in place for them to take that from a laboratory. And, and uh, the, the bigger issue was uh, a custody, so we could have a chain of custody for them to take it to the laboratory, to the hospital to put that in patients. And so when I see that on 60 Minutes, it's a very gratifying thing to know that I helped underneath all of that. Uh, but I run 6,800 clinical research studies or supervise them. I know them all by heart <laughs> um, and uh, try to keep the trains running um, with the motto that we want uh, faculty to think about science and not signatures. And so providing the signatures is somehow gratifying. Well, you obviously had, have had a very impressive career, uh, many, many accomplishments that we didn't have time to discuss, uh, but I assume this video is eventually going to be viewed by a number of uh, young uh, aspiring uh, movement disorder neurologists, and they look to you uh, as uh, one of the leaders in movement disorders uh, for advice and guidance. 
Um, so what uh, guidance would you give to young uh, budding movement disorder neurologists? Take the risk, uh, dive in and do what you want to do, um, and assume all of your mentors are generous. Um, I, I don't know your feeling would like to know it. Uh, let me go first. Um, but I, I mentor a lot of people now, and I don't want to let them down. And so I find myself becoming increasingly generous with the people uh, uh, that I mentor and really work harder and harder for their careers. Um, it's soul restoring for me. But I didn't quite know that um, when I was coming up in my career, which is why you got all the phone calls, because I, I knew you would always give me your best advice. Um, and I should have talked to everybody around me, um, and I would have been better to, to collect um, a, a group of mentors, because they're different skill sets. Um, you can't talk to everybody, and you're the only one, I think, that knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about Ed, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, you, you, obviously, it, uh, I have been inspired by you, um, and uh, you know, I learned from my from my students and, and from my fellows. And uh, I, I just wanted to thank you for uh, the special gift that you gave me uh, during the 30th anniversary of our Women's Disorder Center. You may or may not remember mm -hmm. that, but you presented me uh, with a map of the globe, and you put a pin in uh, the areas of the. Uh, world where my fellows uh, landed, and it was a very, very special and very mm -hmm. meaningful gift. So I want to uh, thank you for for that uh, for that gift. Um, is there anything else you want to say that we have not covered? So I've said it before publicly many times. Thank you for my career. Well, uh, you have accomplished more than I uh, ever dreamed uh, when I first met you, and uh, I'm very, very proud of you. And uh, uh, I look forward to our continued uh, interaction professionally and, more importantly, personally. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mark.